But for right now, let us um, center in with um, an open in prayer. Or as in my work as an embodied anti-racist educator, I'd like to invite you to embrace what is an embodied practice. And by embodied, I mean that during this experience, I really want you to tune into what you are feeling in your body. So let's begin by if you're comfortable, yes, closing the eyes, but you can leave them open during this exercise, during the center and just find the spot, you know, a few inches ahead of you. Um, some of you might have a candle lit, you may have something on your desk that you can just give a soft focus to, to hold that visual attention. Because for some of us, we, we kind of assume closing our eyes is a very comfortable experience. This is not true for everyone. So if you'd rather not, you don't have to. Um, but as you find that spot to focus on or as you close your eyes, um, allow yourself to find stillness in your chair, your sofa, if you're lying in your bed, wherever you are, just find that settling in. And as you settle in, allow your attention to focus on the breath. There's no need to breathe any faster or slower. Just notice the breath, the inflow, the outflow, the pauses between the inhale and the exhale. And at any point your mind wanders during this, simply bring it back to the breath. And we begin today centered in gratitude. Gratitude for this opportunity of community, for this opportunity of centering in spirit, but also centering in our humanity. And for right now, as you begin to center in that energy of gratitude, just do a gentle body scan from the crown of your head, gently all the way down. And should there be any places of tension or tightness or discomfort in the physical body, just simply rest on those for a moment. Breathe into them, that specific gratitude energy. Because it is being grateful for the discomfort that we can know that which needs to be healed, that which needs to be transformed and transmuted. And I invite you as I give my talk today to continue to notice what happens within the body. Continue to notice when there's moments of tension or discomfort, when there's that tightening of the gut, the catching of the breath, simply notice. And again, invite gratitude. Because the discomfort is the path to discovery of what is being called to be healed. I'm grateful for your presence here today and for whoever may be watching this at a later date. And so it is, and so we let it be, amen and amen. So today's absolute word by Reverend Paul Hasselbeck is prosperity. And he says, I am joyfully prosperous. What I have in the bank, the kind of car I drive, or the house I live in are some manifestations of my abundance. The source of all prosperity lies in divine ideas like benevolence, generosity, and abundance, used according to law. I look beyond appearances to find a deeper meaning of prosperity. Meaningful work is part of my prosperity not only because of what I earn, but also because of the satisfaction I feel when I use my skills. My house becomes a home 
when filled with people I love and care for. My financial resources don't diminish but multiply when I share them generously. As I look beyond the good things in my life to the love, the creative insight, and the limitless flow of divine ideas I use to bring them into manifestation, I discover true abundance. I am joyfully prosperous. Let's say that either to ourselves or out loud together. I am joyfully prosperous. One more time. I am joyfully prosperous. Let that be the affirmation that grounds us today in the service and as we go through our week. And it's, it's, it's perfect. This is a, you know, uh, I mean, you, you guys are no strangers to synchronicity, I am sure, but it is the, it is the perfect um, affirmation for what I'm going to uh, get into um, today. And I know you guys are doing your, you're doing uh, the month of joy, um, uh, Reverend Ration told me. Um, so I do want to talk about joy today, but but from a, maybe a different angle. Um, I don't know if she's told you, but for many years in, in, in Unity, um, joy has sort of um, gotten that label as the unofficial 13th power, right? In Unity, we're, we're familiar with the, with the 12 powers and some people like to make the case for joy being the 13th power. Um, I write a column for Unity Magazine, uh, which I all invite you to check out. It's called Love and Justice. And I make the case for justice as the 13th power. Um, and interestingly enough, the pathway to joy or justice, I believe, is, is through healing, okay? And one of the things with joy, however, that I don't think maybe a lot of people talk about is often we conflate joy with happiness, right? We conflate joy as a, uh, as a, as a not just a, a, a spiritual power um, or a state of beingness or, or an energy, but we conflate it with the emotional feeling of happiness. And when this becomes problematic then is um, sometimes when it doesn't feel happy, we tend to wanna to bypass it, we tend to wanna to skip it. This doesn't feel happy. And then we say, this doesn't feel joyful. And if it doesn't feel joyful, therefore it must not be the right thing to do. Uh, so sometimes this might be our thinking in the background, but healing work, for better or for worse, never usually feels good, does it? <laughs> but you healing work can be icky, and as a result, we often um, might push back against it. In fact, for many of us, the healing work doesn't happen until we reach such a place of discomfort or dis-ease that we have no choice but to engage in the healing work. Um, I don't know that many of us seek out deep healing proactively. Uh, we usually wait till kind of doesn't have a choice or comes our way. But healing work is integral to that experience of joy. Let me talk about for me what, what joy means. Uh, first of all, uh, when we look at the metaphysical interpretation of joy, uh, Charles Fillmore defines it as the happiness of God expressed through his perfect idea man. I'm going to update the language a little bit. The happiness of God expressed through God's perfect idea, humanity. So humanity, all y'all on this call and all the other humans not on this call, <laughs> right? We are, we are God's perfect idea. What do we know about God? God, not a person, but a principle. And a principle, again, doesn't occupy space. It doesn't have limitations on time or matter. It's, it's, it's not a person. It's not a body. It doesn't have feelings, thoughts, of emotions, um, but it's, it's just, it just is, it just exists. And it's the underlying cause from which everything comes forth. This is, this is also uh, Charles Fillmore's um, um, interpretation or, or part of the definition of what God is. Um, it, it is, God, that underlying source, is that from which all love springs, not love, again, that emotional feeling, right, that's very, very fickle and conditional, but, but more of a, a universal harmonizing power that unifies everything. 
and and Fillmore also looks as looks to God as absolute wholeness and healing. And for me, that word wholeness is the key to what healing is. I'm sorry, absolute wholeness and perfection. And for me, wholeness is the key to healing because isn't that what healing is? Healing comes from the word hail, which means whole. So healing is uh, returning to and living from our wholeness. So when I mush all these things together, when I think of the word joy in a, in a, in a new metaphysical perspective, for me, it's, it's the happiness that I experience from love-centered healing or love-centered return to wholeness. Joy is the happiness I experience from love-centered healing. The happiness I experience from a love-centered healing. So ironically, joy is the happiness I feel when I do the uncomfortable and super emotional work of deep healing, right? It's what comes from that. And often in spiritual communities, when we talk about healing, we focus on the transformation of spiritual consciousness, right? And that's pretty much what uni is all about. However, we are not just divine, i.e. spirit, we're also human. So if we want that full experience of healing, that full experience of wholeness, that full experience of joy, we don't just have to transform our spiritual consciousness, but we have to transform our human consciousness. And often we, I think, think that, hey, if we just do the spiritual work, the human stuff's going to follow, right? Not so simple. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I'll throw myself under the bus. As I always say, like, it's a big bus. There's plenty of room under it. If you want to come under there with me, you're welcome to. But for me, I know that for years and years, I did a lot of spiritual transformation work. But yet, the human of me still felt stuck in a lot of places, right? And one of those places, for example, um, to I expect to my absolute word is, is around, is around um, finances and abundance. So regardless of the fact that I had all these spiritual tools around that, I still had to do some deep transforming of my human consciousness, which is both my conscious and my unconscious thoughts and beliefs around money, right? And what I learned and what was embedded in me around money and finances. So when we talk about our human consciousness, then it's, it's a lot of the things we identify with as human beings, our thoughts and beliefs around money, around sexuality, around identity, and also around race. And the race is a big thing. Everybody take a breath. Yes, you said the word race. Everybody take a deep breath, right? This is the, this is the, this is the thing which I think many of us struggle around a lot or the most and part of it is because it, it, it's, a, it's a huge thing and unless we really spend some time investigating transforming and shifting our racial consciousness then we're not really doing the full individual work and the full collective human work because the, the collective consciousness and ideas around race that have been embedded in us, especially living here in this country, are grounded in white supremacy thinking. If I take another breath, he said white supremacy, here we go. Okay. So remember in our meditation at the beginning, I invite you to notice any shifts in your body when things are happening. Now, let me be clear. Let me be clear. When I talk about white supremacy and white supremacy culture, I'm not talking about white people. Okay, there's a distinction here. What I'm talking about is the oppression caused by white supremacy and not blaming white people. It's not about a blame thing. I'm talking about a culture that, that harms all of us, regardless of our skin color or our ethnicity or our age or our body type or our sexual orientation or identity. It does harm to everyone. It's a very toxic culture. And much of it is obvious, and even more of it is unconscious and not obvious. And we've internalized a lot of the norms, the white supremacy norms, not on purpose, 
right? No one, no one, uh, I'll bet that no one on this call, I'll, I'll go down a limb and hazard that no one on this call was raised given specific white supremacy instruction. Probably not so much, right? But because we live in that culture, we've internalized a lot of those things. Um, and, and there's a long list, but here are some things which I know that, that, that I have identified with, and maybe you might too, a, a, a sense of urgency, right? Um, how many times have you caught yourself saying, oh, there's so much to do and not enough time in the day, you gotta get it all done. Check the things off the to-do, a sense of urgency, um, as a, a right to, to being made comfortable and feeling comfortable. Uh, paternalism. Paternalism is that idea that I know better than another group of people. Um, and if you don't think paternalism exists in spiritual communities, how many times might you have found yourself saying, unity is like the world's best kept secret. If everyone just like latched on to unity beliefs and lived unity beliefs, oh, this world would be such a better place, right? I, again, under the bus, I've had those thoughts. So what I'm saying is, I think unity's teachings are maybe better than other teachings. That's paternalism, thinking I know what's better for another group, okay? Individualism. You live in America, America is one of America's hashtags, is like that rugged individualism. And even though we know the power of community, right, we still kind of by default go, I got to make sure things are in place and okay for me first, okay? Um, another trait is either or thinking that there's a right way and there's a wrong way, um, as opposed to embracing more of a both and sort of idea. Um, I talked about the getting it right, perfectionism, defensiveness, and, the, and, and two of the big, two of the big like umbrella things that white supremacy uh, manifests as is patriarchy and capitalism. And if you think about it, a lot of the capitalism ideas inform our consciousness around money and prosperity and around abundance. Kind of really do. Um, I'm not going to delve too deep into this because I only got 15, 20 minutes to talk today. So every, everyone have a sigh of relief there. Um, but, but all these things and, and these things inform our human consciousness in obvious ways and in very, very unconscious, subtle ways. Here's another way it shows up maybe in our spiritual journey. How many of y'all, maybe you still do, again, I keep forgetting, throw myself under the bus. Can I tell you how many times as I was learning to meditate and going through my meditation practice, for me, it was like, I got to get it right. I got to learn how to meditate right. And if I'm not feeling some sort of internal peace and bliss, after my 20 minutes of meditation was up, I must have done it wrong. Somebody teach me how to meditate right. Right? There was this, there was this sense of hurriedness and, and the desire to do it right in meditation. Okay. So, so while the intent was good, because we all know the transformative power of meditation, the sense of urgency and rightness around learning to meditate, that is a white supremacy cultural norm that played a part in my spiritual growth, okay? So when I teach meditation now, for example, and you know, I have med when I do meditation classes and people show up and they're like, I struggle with meditation or I don't know how to meditate well and so on and so on. And I ask them, well, well how do you know if you succeeded in meditation? And they give me the litany of things, a peace of mind, silence in the thoughts, Yada, 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 all these things. And I said, I'd like you to embrace a new thought around a successful meditation. Successful meditation occurs when you get to the cushion. That's it. Whatever happens after that, none of our business. You get to the cushion and you set aside time to meditate and you actually get there. That's it. You have, you have succeeded. You have succeeded because when you sit to meditate, there's no telling what's going to happen. Okay, you you're, you're not going to stop your brain from having thoughts. That's the whole reason your brain was made. You can't shut your brain off. Thank God, otherwise your lungs will stop working and your heart will stop beating. So the brain's going to do what the brain does. Are they techniques to shift your attention so you're not focused on what your brain is? Yes, but 
in the middle of meditation, thoughts are going to spring into your mind. And if you're, and if you're, your focus is, I got it wrong because thoughts came into my mind, you failed at meditation. It's not the point of meditation. Okay. So the point of meditation is to, is to, is to practice stillness internally so that then we can practice stillness externally. And stillness does not mean an absolute void. Okay. So, 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 so the journey and our relationship with what we think about ourselves and what we think about our spiritual practices is ultimately also tied to our human consciousness. So again, back to that healing is not just transforming our spiritual consciousness, but our human consciousness as well. And how do we transform our human consciousness? We have to do what I call deconstruct and decolonize. Deconstruct and decolonize. What's deconstructing? Deconstructing is, when you break down the word, the opposite of constructing, of building. So it's basically tearing down. It's basically looking to see what went into building all the thoughts and the beliefs that I have. Why do I think the way I think? Why do I believe the things I believe? Get into the root of those and sort of reverse engineering uh, yourself. So that's deconstruct. Decolonize is what I referred to earlier, specifically looking at how being raised in this American culture and context, white supremacy thinking influence those building blocks. Think of a wall. It's like, it's like uh, your thoughts and beliefs are those bricks and, 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 White supremacy thinking is kind of like the, the cement or the mortar between the bricks. And again, this is nobody's fault here. It's just the culture we were in, right? It's like a fish in water. Fish is, fish, you know, ask a fish what water is like. Fish is like, what do you mean water? I, I don't understand this thing you're talking about, right? So, so that's where we're in. And it's none of our fault, so no one's to blame here. However, however, what is ours to do if we truly want to transform, not just our individual, but the collective consciousness, the collective culture, we've got to do that individual deconstructing and decolonizing. And just like the spiritual work and the spiritual transformation we do, one, it doesn't, it doesn't happen with one meditation or one class or one sermon, right? It's an ongoing process, it's an ongoing process. So like, um, and if you're probably familiar with mindfulness practices, right? Uh, the idea of, um, you know, where's my attention right now? My favorite mindfulness practice is Thich Nhat Hanh's The Mindful Eating Practice. Why? Because A, I love to eat, I love food. So if I can work in a mindfulness practice while I'm eating food, <laughs> kill two birds with one stone. So, so there's that, but, but this is mindfulness. So, so just as we apply this to where my attention is, Let's apply this to decolonizing practices. So do, how often do we ask ourselves, when do these white supremacy traits show up in my life? How often do I feel hurried? How often do I feel I'm uncomfortable and I, and I shouldn't be uncomfortable? I, I need to get comfortable quick. You know, how many times do we get stuck in either or thinking and we're trying to find the right way to do a thing? Um, uh, how many times do um, are we aware, especially us men, how many times are we aware of we are using our, in, our internalized patriarchy privilege, right? Now, we're probably saying as men, I'm sorry, Bob, it's just me and you, so I'm, I'm, I'm dragging you under the bus with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, many of us as men, especially uh, those of us who, who spend some time in New Thought, and in spiritual communities, we like to think of ourselves as, um, as good feminists, right? We, 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 we don't see there's any disparities between men and women. We're good feminists. And you would be surprised. I know I was after being in many, many conversations with women, especially older, wiser women, how much of uh, the patriarchy, specifically sexism and misogyny, I had internalized and still had it in my ways of thinking. Here's a perfect example. Anytime I'm driving down the street and I see there's someone 
who is having trouble parking or just driving in a way that's not consistent with how I think somebody should drive. My first thought for years used to be, must be a woman. Like that was my first thought. And, and slowly along with that, also must be an Asian woman. I mean, like the, the, I'm not proud to admit it, but that was a lot of my internalized thinking and my unconscious thinking. I was like, well, where did, where did that come from? Why, why do I think that? Um, you know, uh, that, that's, just a, that's just an example. But I wasn't even aware that I was still holding on to that thought unless I'm in conversations and interactions with, with other people. Because when I'm driving and those thoughts pop up, my attention is back to the road and I'm driving and I don't give it, I don't give it another thought. So this is part of the work we do around healing ourselves, deconstructing and decolonizing. How many of us ask ourselves, what's my relationship to my racial identity? How many of us think about our racial identity? How many of us even think that we have a racial consciousness? So to do this work, just like any other spiritual practice, it, it requires practice and requires being in the space especially with other community people who are, who are practicing it. So this is actually the work I do right now. I'm, I'm no longer the minister in a church. Um, I, I, I quit that job last year. And part of it was with due to COVID. COVID uh, really helped me to ask myself, how do I want to spend the remainder of my life? I'm 48, by the way. I plan to live to 120. Just letting y'all know that. So how do we want to spend the remaining two-thirds of my life? And, and this, is, this is what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm consciously choosing ways to do that. And a lot of that work is around my own deconstruction and decolonizing. And what came out of that inquiry was partnering with um, Reverend Kelly Isla. Some of you might know her. And we started an online platform called the Project Sanctus. Project Sanctus, it's a, we describe it as a safe, brave space to live our holiest selves. Our holy selves is our fully healed self. And again, that comes through deconstruction and decolonizing. And to be clear, it's not like we get to an end point. It's, it's around the process of doing the work, because it's in the process of doing the work that we continue to shift, that we continue to dive deeper, we continue to heal, we continue to transform ourselves as individuals and therefore as a culture, okay? It's the, it's the journey, there's, there's, there's no real end point because there will always be something to transform uh, with, within us. So some of the work that we do at Project Sanctus is uh, not just book studies and workshops, um, but we do something called affinity groups and an affinity group twice a month, we get together and we just have conversations and we talk about issues. It is in these affinity groups that I really became aware of my internalized uh, patriarchy and sexism. Um, one of those affinity groups a month, um, we, we divide by uh, white bodies and what we call bodies of color or bodies of culture. And most of the time it's me and like four or five other older black women. And there's nothing like sitting in a room or in a Zoom room with older black women to let you know how sexist you really are, <laughs> right? And we don't have, and we don't like start with, well, let's talk about sexism. It's not like that. We just having conversations about what's going on in the world or what's going on in people's lives. As we're doing this and I'm noticing the thoughts that I'm having in response to what they're saying, I'm going like, holy cow, where are these thoughts coming from? I'll give you, give you one quick example, one quick example. Um, I'm from Barbados originally, and one of the women in the group was from Grenada, a neighboring Caribbean country, right? And um, she's in her 60s and, I, and, and uh, retired recently. And I said to her, oh, so are you, are you gonna move back to Grenada? Cause I'm thinking eventually at some point I wanna move back to Barbados. She goes, no, I'm never moving back to Grenada. And I was kind of shocked. So I was like, well, why wouldn't you wanna do that? Like Grenada's uh, get, get out of this crazy US and get back to like an idyllic 
tropical island. Why would you not want to do that? And she goes, when I talk to my friends, it's always the men who want to go back and never the women. I was like, really? Why is that? She goes, you've never been a woman in the Caribbean. You think the patriarchy is bad here. Think about your experience going up in Barbados. It's like, oh my God, she's right. She's so right. I didn't, I, like, I didn't actively think about that. And Harry was judging her for not wanting to go back to an experience that benefited me as a man. Right? So, and that just came out of conversation. So, so this is what we have to do. We have to put ourselves in situations just like to transform our spiritual consciousness. We put ourselves in situations to do that, like meditation classes, uh, other, other unity classes, come into a service on a Sunday morning. So to shift our racial consciousness, we got to put ourselves in situations that will provoke that as well. So we, so we have opportunities for that at Project Sanctus. We actually have a couple of workshops coming up I want to mention. One of them is called Love and Rage. Um, this is work that is based on teachings by a, a, a Buddhist practitioner, Lama Rod Owens. Um, he's a Black queer man, and, and it's really about redefining our, our relationship with anger and using that as actually a path to deeper love. And then we got another one coming up called Talking to Your People, because what we realize is the holidays are coming, and sometimes people travel for the holidays or family members come, and sometimes... I don't know how to put this, you know, I'll just say sometimes we have family members we don't want to be family members with. You know what I'm saying? We have some family members with some thoughts and beliefs that may not align with our own. And often what we do is we just decide we're not going to talk about those things. We're not going to talk about religion. We're not going to talk about politics. We're not going to talk about the election. We're not going to talk about, like, the list of things we're not going to talk about is, like, 10 times longer than the list of things we are going to talk about. But what happens with that is then when we do that, we don't build bridges between ourselves and our family members. We don't find the places of common ground. And we can't transform this collective culture on our own, back to that individualism I talked about. So this workshop is designed to, to equip us with some skills around how do I talk to people who don't agree with me in any way, whether it's politically, philosophically, however. So that's another workshop we got. Uh, coming up but the true work the true work and the magic that we do is in the affinity groups because these are ongoing every month twice a month people are showing up and having these uncomfortable conversations right back to that definition of joy the happiness i experience from love-centered healing and healing is indeed uncomfortable work the author james Baldwin talks about love does not begin and end the way we seem to think it does. Love is a battle. Love is a war. Love is a growing up. Love takes off the mask we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. That last part, love takes off the mask we fear we cannot live without and know we cannot live within. And that's what healing really is. Healing is like taking off those embedded beliefs of the different masks that we wear, the fears that get between us and the experience we truly want to have, the stand between us and the deep healing and the, and, the, and, the, and the stirring up the wounds. And joy is also emotional work. And it's not about happiness. Here's what Rumi has to say. Rumi writes, sorrow prepares you for joy. It violently sweeps everything out of the house so that new joy can find space to enter. It shakes the yellow leaves from the bow of your heart so that fresh green leaves can grow in their place. It pulls up the rotten roots so that new roots hidden beneath have room to grow. Whatever sorrow shakes from your heart, far better things will take their place. But I love that first line. Sorrow prepares you for joy. Sorrow prepares you for joy. Unless you think, unless you think it's going to be nice work, was that second thing he says, it violently sweeps everything out of your house. Violently. So this deep inner transforming work, this deconstruction, this decolonizing, this returning to wholeness, this healing work is uncomfortable. It is emotional. It is messy. It is violent. And none of those are words that we like to think about when it comes to spiritual transformation. 
but this is the work and this is what brings us the experience of the fullness of joy when we heal when we do that deep work so my invitation for you this week is to ask yourselves do i truly want to transform myself and the culture around me do i truly want to create a space of of love and justice and liberation for myself and for everyone else in the world in order to do that and to transform my consciousness, both spiritual and human, and part of that human is racial consciousness. So I have to transform that in myself, trusting that if everyone else does that work as well, we will be transforming the culture as a whole. And we will be healing not just ourselves, but healing the world. This is our work, joy. From Charles Fulmore, the happiness of God expressed through God's perfect idea of humanity. As I like to think of it, the happiness I experience from love-centered healing and wholeness. So let's take this into meditation a little bit. So once again, if you're comfortable closing the eyes, if not, just center on a point a few inches in front of you. Take a soft gaze. Get in a comfortable seated or stand in or lying position, whatever allows your body to be in a place of stillness at this time. And once again, turn your attention to the breath and simply breathe, no quicker, no faster, just allow the natural breath to flow. And as you breathe, notice what's happening in your body right now. Notice any places or of discomfort, of tension. Notice any places of alignment with what I said or discomfort with what I said and what you heard. And allow yourself to rest in the question of who am I in relation to myself? Who am I in relation to myself? Where does both my spiritual and human consciousness spring from? What is my work to do around transforming my racial consciousness? And in so doing, shifting the racial consciousness of the world. Knowing that when we do this, we truly inhabit joy and bring joy to the world. So let us rest in the openness of these questions for a few moments in the silence.
And again, we return with gratitude. Being thankful for knowing that we already have and are all that we need within us to do this work. To be the transform humans and spirit that we seek to be. We are grateful. And so it is, and so we let it be. Amen.